Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, our program is AI Chat, GBT and Beyond. It's one of um, Mike Gershbein's uh, newer programs. And as soon as he mentioned uh, offering it, I thought it would be great uh, to bring him on board at our library to present it for, um, for our community. So I'm happy to have um, Mike join us. He's presented many programs at the ELA library. You probably just did a program within the last few months, I'm sure, right, Mike? Yeah, I don't remember what it was, but I did something. <laughs> I know you're doing quite a bit. Uh, as I mentioned, we are recording tonight's session. Um, if you want to uh, replay any of it, it will be on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A and chat. Mike uh, will keep an eye on both of those and either answer them during his presentation tonight or following his presentation. So, uh, Mike, welcome back. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. So my name is Mike Gershwein, and uh, I've got a monitor to my right where I do keep an eye on the chat and I keep an eye on the questions. And uh, depending on what you ask, I'll answer them along the way or I'll answer them later or I'll answer them at the end. But either way, I am. You can't talk. I mean, you can talk, I want to hear you, but uh, I will keep an eye on the questions over there. So today we are talking about, this evening, talking about artificial intelligence. ChatGPT is in the title. Uh, so uh, artificial intelligence has been kind of around for a long, long time. I'll, I'll talk about that. But uh, ChatGPT was a thing that was in the news about a year ago that kind of brought it to everybody's attention, even though it's been running stuff for a long, long time. And for those of you who, uh, I, first couple of times I did this class, I was halfway through and then a couple of people raised their hands and said, what's ChatGPT? So I, I realized that some of you may not have actually even heard of that or may not be aware of it. And I will be going into it in, in depth in the class, but some people have referred to it as kind of a, a much better form of Google, which I guess I'm okay with as, <laughs> as far as kind of starting off this, uh, this discussion uh, with that definition, uh, you can see, you know, it's Google times a large number, uh, but uh, that's okay for us to, to start it off with. It, it uh, generates text based on questions and images, things like that. We'll get into that in more detail. So I will demonstrate it at a certain point. So just if, you know, you're totally not following, then, then that's okay, I'll, I'll show it in action. One thing to keep in mind with this class, and I was always I wanted to do this class for a long time, and I was a little bit nervous about doing it. I do a lot of tech classes, but this one in particular, I find that we walk along a chasm of technology in that as soon as I move away from the basic concepts, we move into some heavy technology terminology, heavy technology definitions. And uh, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go that direction. And honestly, I'm not a programmer. I teach technology for adults. I make it understandable for adult, adults. I try to. I'm not somebody who's out there make, creating artificial intelligence systems. And once you kind of move away from the basic concepts of how it works into the, uh, the nitty gritty about how it works, it becomes complicated. And then we're talking about things that are... Uh, uh, probably beyond the scope of this class, which is to say that I keep this at a basic level. I try to keep this at a basic level. However, be forewarned, a couple slides, I'll be throwing you some, some terms, some technology. If you don't follow it all, that's okay. If you want to go deeper, there's no shortage of online videos and classes. I was just watching. I wanted a deeper understanding of, of one of the things I was talking about. Uh, so I watched a YouTube video just the other day about it. And I was about 10 minutes in and I was like, uh, that's enough. I think I, I think I know that's in depth enough. So that is something to keep in mind. Of all the technologies I teach, this is the one that's that's most like that, where it's really easy to get bogged down in the technology if you're not careful. Oh, so that being said, enough of just me talking. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll walk through my slides. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what artificial intelligence is. And by the way, one of the other kind of challenges that I've got as I teach this stuff is I find that there aren't necessarily good definitions. There's not like a standard definition of all these things. So some of the stuff I, I, I mean, they're not even agreed upon necessarily. So some of the stuff I do my best to kind of 
give you what I feel is a, a pretty decent definition of whatever it is that, that we're talking about. So what is artificial intelligence to begin with? Uh, artificial intelligence, as I say here, the simulation of human intelligence by machines, especially computer systems. Cognitive skills, the skills that are parts of human intelligence, include learning, reasoning, self-correction, and even creativity, which is amazing. You're talking about a computer that is potentially creative. So we're talking about systems that uh, act like human brains that resemble human brains. Uh, notice the word stimulation that seem to work like human brains. And a lot of times we talk about, uh, people talk about two different types of AI. Weak AI, which sounds disappointing, but is pretty much every type of AI that's out there right now. In this case, it's a system that performs a specific thing that you ask it to do and has specific knowledge about that thing that it's doing. And then we also hear about strong AI, which is also kind of referred to as artificial general intelligence. And this is one of those sneaky terms where there's a lot of disagreement about what artificial general intelligence means, when we will reach it, how we judge that we've reached it. But in that case, basically, you've got a system that you can't distinguish from the human mind. It's uh, making decisions. It's learning and uh, it's doing this all on its own. It's kind of removed itself as uh, uh, from uh, human interaction. So, you know, some people have said that uh, ChatGPT, for example, seems like an early version of artificial and general intelligence. A lot of people feel that it's not really. Uh, how far away are we from this? Once again, a lot of disagreement about this. This is honestly... We're talking about this in an online class, but this is the stuff that that uh, uh, highly paid tech uh, um, CEOs and and probably poorly paid philosophers that are out there discussing uh, what is going to make a system, you know, indistinguishable from from the human brain. So some of the major AI technologies that are out there right now, uh, as is, there's probably more subsets in this, but but you know, kind of a handful. Natural language processing, in that case, these are systems that can uh, look at words that you text in or can text you words back or uh, respond in other ways using human language, using our natural language. Expert systems is just kind of a generic term for a kind of a, a, a database, a knowledge base that can answer specific questions. I always think about whenever I see this, I think about how you go to your Discover card. There's actually a commercial in the Super Bowl where the woman calls up Discover and she's like, wow, for a computer, you sound really human. And that's the sense of this, which is you go to your Discover card website or call them up and you're interacting with, with a system that is expert in credit card answers. You can ask it anything about your credit limit or payments and things like that, but you can't ask it a, uh, uh, about movies or, or uh, to write you a poem or anything like that. They're good at one thing. Computer vision, your system can recognize images. It can classify images. It can see. It can just basically see and bring in images from around the, the world around it. Speech is things like converting text into speech or speech into text things that we've been doing for a while on our phone and, and other places. Uh, businesses will use it for planning, uh, uh, coming up with with uh, uh, better the best ways of running things in the business. And then robotics, all the robots on the factory floor, those things like uh, that. These are all kind of uh, around and have been around for, uh, for a while now. Why are we using AI in the first place? Well, it does a lot of things well. Detail-oriented jobs can pick out all the little specific details of the things that it's working on and certainly faster, especially when these tasks involve a ton of data that it's got to process. Uh, it can automate things. So, you know, these regular things that we do in a back office, it allows us, frees us up to do kind of either more complicated things or, or more creative things uh, because it's better at all these things, it increases productivity, stays accurate, stays consistent, no matter what it's doing. Uh, personalization is interesting. You know, it, it learns kind of uh, uh, interests and uh, uh, other kind of things that it needs to know about people that it's interacting with and it can personalize its interaction uh, with those people, whether they're uh, customers, often it's customers or, or other people that it happens to be interacting with. 
innovation, decision making. It's making connections between things in the background and making decisions about all these things that it's making connections with. And because it's a computer system, it is always available running and doing these things. And as I said, it's been around for a while. So there's a lot of kind of areas where we are using AI and we've been using it for years. So these, once again, I mentioned this discover chatbot or whatever, wherever you go online, where the first thing that pops up is a path as a chatbot. How can I help you? You know, rather than paying for people to sit on the other end, this is an automated system that will allow a conversation around canned responses. And a lot of times they don't work that well, but <laughs> maybe they're getting better as the technology is getting better. Then we have things like facial recognition or image analysis. And those are uh, uh, actually, I think about those partly with the point that's a couple more down with self-driving cars, but also security systems, Google doorbells, you know, somebody comes to your door and recognizes their face or use your face to unlock your phone. So all these things can pull in all types of this image analysis. Photo editing, this is one of these things that's been amazing for a while. They haven't really thrown around the term AI with it, but I don't know if you remember, or you probably still see these ads where uh, uh, like Google's doing a lot with this, where you pull up your phone and there's a picture of a beach and you and your sweetheart are standing on the beach looking beautiful and there's some guy right off to the left. And then in the commercial, you circle the guy with your finger and just drag him off the phone and the the a photo editing system automatically fills in that background. That's AI doing that in the background. And it's absolutely incredible. It's getting better and better and better. Self-driving cars, who have been around the road for almost 20 years at this point. They haven't been hugely uh, successful or commercialized because they're not quite maybe safe enough. But I mean, in California, they've been driving themselves around for, uh, for almost 20 years. And, um, you know, accumulating data, using these AI systems to make decisions for them. Speech recognition, predictive text, real-time translation. A lot of this stuff is stuff that you see on your phone or you use on your phone or you talk to uh, whatever, Surrey, or you dictate, or you Google both Gmail and, and iPhones use it where you start typing and predicts the next word, predicts the next word, predicts the next word. This real-time translation, this has been around a long, long time. And if you're a world traveler and you haven't tried using this real-time translation in an app, take a picture of a menu while you're sitting at a restaurant. It'll translate everything into English. It's it's really, really incredible round for, I, I've been using it for years and years. Recommendation engines, those are things like uh, going into uh, something like uh, Spotify or Netflix and having it recommend things based on the patterns of things. Or Facebook, you know, Facebook, is it's interesting. They've been using artificial intelligence for years and years and years, but they don't talk about it because they do it all in the background. So the stuff that it's feeding up to you is kind of recommended people or recommended uh, 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 Facebook pages, things like that, using AI in the background. So quick history to kind of give you a sense of, of how long it's been around and where it's how it's kind of developed 1940s we came up with the original stored program computer basically a computer could store stuff on it in in its memory and the idea of neural networks which i'll talk about a little bit later but this is the background of how ai works in the 50s and 60s we had uh further developments a couple of which alan turing and the turing test so some of you may have heard of the turing test that's the idea of, of interacting with a computer and trying to determine if it's human or not. So they have an annual test literally every year where somebody goes and they talk, probably using a keyboard with a, uh, with a, they talk with a computer and they try to guess whether it's actually a computer or a human on the other end. And uh, no, no computer systems, no AI systems have actually passed the Turing test as, as of up till now but they get better and better and better at seeming like there's an, a, a human that, that people are talking to. Logic theorist was the basically the concept of the first AI program that was presented at a conference that was that was a really well-known computer conference that, that set the boundaries for AI. Then in the 70s and the 80s, we had a couple of slow periods when it came to AI development. There were two big, what we call AI winters, essentially uh, uh, funding dried up and computer processing power just wasn't there. So a lot of the concepts were out there, 
we just didn't have the technology to make it work. And then in the 90s, we started seeing more advances. One of the ones that you may have heard of at some point is IBM's Deep Blue. That was this one that went and played chess against Gary Kasparov and beat him. And Gary Kasparov said, well, it's over. <laughs> uh, the computers have beaten us. But, you know, once again, IBM's Deep Blue, Deep Blue did one thing really well. It, it played chess really well. And that was what it was good at. But the, the, uh, that's an artificial intelligence system. In the 2000s, a lot happening on the on uh, the internet. Google search, a lot of us take it for granted, but if you think about it, you know the ability to put in words, misspell them, or leave out words, and Google knows actually what we're looking for. So it's it's filling in the blanks in this uh, uh, artificial intelligence system. Recommendation engines, I already kind of mentioned that, things like uh, 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 these systems that we use, looking at all the stuff we listen to and watch and giving us recommended uh, other options. Facial recognition, you know, Facebook was doing this 10 years and they had to, 10 years ago, they had to uh, take it out. But even stuff like, once again, your phone recognizing you, speech into text, self-driving cars, all this stuff was developing in the 2000s. IBM Watson, that's another one where uh, occasionally we still hear about it. It still exists in some form. It, it, I think they focused it on medical research, but they're trying to kind of rebrand it a little bit. And I think they used it at, at Wimbledon or something for some type of analysis. But when IBM Watson was launched, it became famous because it went and it played uh, Ken Jennings in Jeopardy and it beat him in Jeopardy. And once again, system that is specifically designed to win at Jeopardy, but it did a really good job at it. In the 2010s, we saw voice assistants come around, Surrey and Alexa, and uh, OpenAI was created in 2015. OpenAI is the company behind ChatGPT, actually GPT, which is the, the kind of knowledge base that GPT, ChatGPT runs on, and DALI, which is image creation. So OpenAI is a very important player in this right now because ChatGPT opened the floodgates, uh, uh, which we can say, of, of artificial intelligence. That is a company that is, uh, it's it's weird structure, and, and they've been the been the news recently because Elon Musk is suing them. He was uh, original. Uh, he was originally, he was with them for some time. Anyway, um, they are fifty one percent essentially a private company and forty nine percent owned by Microsoft. So the key thing there being that Microsoft ownership means that a lot of our future exposure over the next couple of years is probably going to come through Microsoft products. Uh, there are competitors and I'll hit some of them, but if you use a Windows computer at home or at work, you are gonna start to see what uh, their branding of uh, ChatGPT called Copilot. If you've been on your computer and you've noticed Copilot popping up or you've been on Microsoft Edge and they say use Copilot, that is chat, essentially ChatGPT rebranded as a Microsoft product. And that is going to keep popping up on your Windows machine, popping up, popping up. And so that is what to, to keep in mind, that Microsoft is driving a lot of this. And Copilot branding is just their branding for this artificial uh, intelligence system that is based on GPT. Excuse me. So key kind of uh, concept behind a, or a key thing that a lot of these AI systems run on is what's called machine learning. Machine learning, as I say here, enables these systems to learn and perform tasks without explicit instructions through use of statistical algorithms. So there are, and there's a certain amount of human intervention, human interaction, different degrees, which I'll kind of cover in a second. Point being though, it's not just programming a system do this, then do this, then do this, then do that. Uh, these systems do tend to learn and make decisions on their own. And how do they do that? They use statistics. And that's one of these kinds of things where when we kind of summarize how they all work is, is really hard to wrap our minds around. But this idea that uh, uh, ChatGPT works similarly to when you're using your iPhone and it's predicting the next word. You know, you start typing and, and it predicts a word for you. ChatGPT and uh, these other AI systems are basically doing that times a billion. They're predicting all of these words at the end based on statistically whether that would be a, a good fit for, for the answer for what you're asking. So these systems, these AI systems, 
use uh, data sets in order to train them, in order to, to get them smart on the information that they're going to be working with. These data sets can be labeled or they can be unlabeled, okay? In the case of labeled, then we're going to have a bunch of stuff that has all kinds of different labels describing what it is that the system is being trained upon. If it's unlabeled, we're just throwing in a whole bunch of data and the AI system is making all kinds of connections on its own. It's not a, one system is not better than the other. Each system is kind of a different way of using data and depending on what you're trying to accomplish with this AI system, it either makes sense to have all these things labeled and just break it down. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment, or it makes sense to have them no labels at all, throw them in the system and have this AI system kind of make its own connections. Uh, now, when you're working with this type of data, you're doing uh, these types of learning, either supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement, or some kind of combination. With supervised learning, then there is a human involved who's going to uh, label all those data sets, put them in, and work with the system in order to come out with, with the appropriate answers. Unsupervised learning means, once again, throwing them all in there, letting the system come up with its own answers. And then a lot of what we see also, you know, a mixed with something like unsupervised learning is reinforcement learning, which means that you wait for the system to come up with its own conclusions. And then you say, good job. And you, and you reward it. Or you say, eh, it's not quite right. And you tweak it, you fix it, and, you know, otherwise uh, reinforce it. Another thing that is uh, worth talking about because it, it, it applies, especially as these systems get more and more complex is deep learning and, and a system like ChatGPT does deep learning, which basically means less humans involved. There will certainly be a certain amount of humans involved, but tons and tons of, of data. Basically, uh, we'll talk about neural networks in a little bit, but deep learning just has all these deep, deep, deep layers uh, that uh, this information goes through in order to get the answers popping up on the other end and neural networks is how they do it. We'll talk about that in a second. So. You want a set, you want an artificial intelligence system that identifies animals, right? Let's say we try doing this with uh, with labeled data. In that case, we have all this data, thousands of thousands of pet images, probably a lot more than thousands, you know, billions, millions, billions of images of pets. And uh, we label them all, we break them down, we say, well, cat, cat is brown and has four paws and ears and eyes and blah, 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 blah to, uh, uh, you know, to the minute detail. And then we put in the system and we ask the system, hey, identify all the cats for me, identify all the dogs for me, identify all the birds for me. And we look at the results and we see, oh, well, it's found all these cats mostly, but it made a couple mistakes. We go in there and we tweak either the labels or other things to make it more accurate. Okay. Now, if you have an unlabeled data set and more of a deep learning system, in that case, you are going to just throw in a whole bunch of pictures of, of animals that are unlabeled. And the system will pass through all of uh, these nodes and break these uh, uh, pictures down into kind of common things that it finds between them and decide what it needs to identify the animals. So the system on its own, if it's working really well, will come up with this basically uh, uh, endpoint where it says, well, these all have all this in common. And you say, oh yeah, okay, those are cats. And these have all this in common. And then you say, okay, those are dogs. So in this case, the system is a little bit smarter. Uh, it's picking out things on its own and making connections. People are giving it some guidance, but it, it is doing that on its own. Once again, you know, you can see potentially how you might use these in different ways, even though this, I would say that the deep learning one is kind of, smarter, and deep learning, by the way, is a type of machine learning, but deep learning is kind of smarter. That doesn't mean you have to use it in every uh, uh, type of artificial intelligence. You can you have plenty of labeled learning and for the, for the needs of that system, it may work well. So, you know, once again, labeled data, these dogs, that's the weight, that's a dog, traits that they have in unlabeled data, you're just putting in the picture and you're asking the system to find commonalities. So I mentioned neural networks a couple of different times. The metaphor for neural networks is the human brain. So brain, got all these neurons connecting information and send it to other neurons to process things that our eyes see, that our ears hear. 
send uh, information to the rest of our body, things like that. It, it, it takes the information that your, that your brain perceives and does something with it. So the AI neural networks are kind of a similar metaphor to that. So inspired by the human brain, you've got all these little nodes passing down information in order to get it to come out with, with uh, something on the other end. So we'll get input layer, all this, you know, the question or whatever input somebody puts in, goes through all of these hidden layers in the neural network, and then it comes out at the end with whatever you're looking for as a result, the answer to a question, a picture, things like that. Now it does, uh, uh, it is capable of, of doing things like generalizing or inferring. So if you put in a question and uh, it, it doesn't have all the data potentially that it needs, maybe it can in make inferences about uh, uh, the things that you may be looking for, or it, uh, it can kind of generalize the things that you're asking in a larger sense. Uh, it will summarize the things that you're putting in and filter out the stuff that isn't useful. It will weight these various things, and then it will transmit that information down that neural network, and it will still keep the relationship between the words that you've input. Uh, one of my kind of favorite examples about how difficult this is to do is if you look at a simple sentence that you need a neural network to understand, the pitcher poured water into a cup until it was full. Okay, the pitcher poured water into a cup until it was full. In that case, the cup is full. Or you could say the pitcher poured water into a cup until it was empty. In that case, the pitcher is empty. In one case, we're talking about full being the cup. In one case, we're talking about pitcher being the empty, being empty. And the, the system has to know the relationships between these terms, even though the differences are very subtle and they're clearly capable of doing this. A uh, very basic look at a neural network. Put in the input, question, uh, command, whatever, goes through all these hidden layers, breaks it down, and, and comes out with an output at the end. So then we are getting to things that are uh, uh, closer to um, basically getting to our, our uh, uh, chat GPT system. So we're talking about things like natural language processing. In this case, we have prompts. Human language, we don't have to be computer programmers or anything like that. We ask or we type into the system and ask a question or asks for something to be created. And then the system will respond to our natural language, which is once again, pretty amazing considering the complexity of our language. The term generative AI is a term that you'll hear a lot in, uh, these days as the type of AI that people are using. Basically it will create some type of media or text based on what we asked for. If we asked for a three-page essay on uh, the history of, uh, of uh, you know, or the, the Civil War, something like that, it will spit it out based on our user prompts. If we ask it to create an image, spit it out based on our, our prompts. It generates some type of things based on its artificial intelligence. Now, large language models are specifically uh, what something like ChatGPT and some of its competitors are. And in that case, it, we ask it a question, it understands what we're asking, summarizes what we're asking, and then generates, and once again, that word predicts new content because it is a predictive system based on statistics. What are the odds that the words are gonna be uh, uh, as follows? Text to image models, are the other kind of exciting thing that's happening right now and very controversial, which are creating these images from the uh, text description. So we ask it to picture, to create a picture of a cow on a bicycle smoking a cigar, creates a cow on a bicycle smoking a cigar. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this is that these systems will typically have some type of guardrails put in place, determined by the creators of the system. Meaning, if you were to go into ChatGPT, ask it to uh, how to build an atomic bomb, it won't tell you. Ask it how to create malware, it won't tell you. It might know how to do it, but it's not going to tell you. It won't uh, hopefully say racist things. There's a lot of these kinds of, of things that the creators and the people who maintain these will put in place uh, in order to to you know keep it so that people don't or that people will want to interact with it. And this is one of these things where 
Well, we still occasionally see it, but we saw it a lot more when ChatGPT was first launched, where we'd get into arguments with people or uh, insult people, uh, and and uh, the creators didn't really uh, didn't really want it doing it. Or other things like uh, there's ChatGPT's competitor uh, that Google has is Google Gemini, and they just came out and they said they're not going to include any election information in it. So you can't ask it about the upcoming election, uh, uh, or you can ask, but it will say that it's not able to do it because they're trying to avoid controversy. Or ChatGPT, I think the cutoff date for the most recent version is is last year. So if you were to ask about anything that happened in the news in this last week, it wouldn't have information about it. So what these guardrails are are determined by the people who create these, so even though they may have the data to, to answer the things that they're being asked about they may not be allowed to do it. So the, these natural languages, AIs, uh, can do a whole lot of stuff. Earlier, I kind of defined ChatGPT as you know, Google times whatever number you want to call it, and, and maybe it is, but it certainly does a lot more than Google. Yes, it can provide information, which is, you know, at its most basic form, when you kind of think about it compared to Google, when you ask Google a question, it's going to give you links to a bunch of places that have the information, whereas with something like ChatGPT, it'll just give you the information that you're looking for. Uh, maybe Google will link to Wikipedia, but in this case, uh, ChatGPT is summarizing a whole bunch of information and, and uh, putting it together. It will translate languages, summarize a document or, or a slideshow, or, you know, uh, uh, my wife's favorite example of this is that she'll do something like a Zoom show and, and they'll have the transcript of it and put up the transcript into ChatGPT and ask it to summarize the the, the Zoom uh, uh, meeting that's been going on for the last hour, come up with bullet points, things like that. Um, really useful that way. They can do creative writing. We can try that later. We'll have it write some poems for us and certainly can do computer coding, uh, uh, simulations and idea generation. Oh, if you are a business person or looking to start a business and you're just like, or looking for a job, and you kind of want uh, help with your resume or business names or product ideas, any of this type of stuff, this is just like having a collaborator that can throw out all kinds of ideas for you that, that you can then accept or, or reject or manipulate. And then you can also just have a, a general conversation. These systems could be your friend. So when I started planning this class, I did the obvious thing, which was go to ChatGPT and ask it to give me a 20 page slide outline for a presentation on the history, current trends and future of artificial intelligence, including examples of learning language models, image generation and other types of AI currently in use. And this is what ChatGPT split out, spit out for me. Uh, slide one was, the, was a title slide. It gave me the title, artificial intelligence, past, present and future uh, with a subtitle, exploring the evolution of AI and emerging trends, Slide two gave, uh, said I should define artificial intelligence, give a brief overview of it, and this little thesis statement, et cetera, et cetera. Gave me 20 different slides as kind of a, a, the, a potential uh, backbone for my slideshow. So if you've been paying attention up till now, you'll see my slideshow has not followed this exactly. And a lot of times it's, it's been quite different. Uh, ChatGPT thought it might be useful for me to have an entire slide on the AI winters, where I went on about the AI winters and periods of reduced funding. And I found that it probably made more sense to include that in a single bullet point on a different slide. But this really gave me a nice way to start. This gave me a uh, really good uh, way to start thinking about how I could organize this presentation. I changed it quite a bit. I know the audiences that I'm speaking to, and I could have said something, you know, I could have given more definition about the audience that this is intended for, and maybe that would have made it different, but great starting point for this presentation, even though I did end up changing it quite a bit. So when it comes to large language models, we do keep talking about ChatGPT. ChatGPT has kind of uh, two main uh, knowledge bases behind them. There's 3.5 and 4. And 3.5 is the older version. If you go to chatgpt.com and use it there, you'll be using 3.5. GPT-4 is a newer version. It's better, more powerful. Uh, actually, the best way to experience GPT-4 is to go to bing.com. 
which once again is Microsoft product. If you use the Edge web browser, you'll see that it's popping up on the right a lot. Uh, uh, they're talking about uh, using uh, Bing, uh, that co-pilot branding. But if you go to bing.com, I'll show you this later, you can use ChatGPT there, and that actually uses GPT-4. It uses the newest version of GPT, whereas if you're using uh, the ChatGPT website, you need to pay in order to get the newest version of GPT. Now, Google, a couple of weeks ago, came out or announced that it was rolling out its Google Gemini uh, competitor for ChatGPT. It's been controversial a little bit. I'll talk about it why a little bit later, but definitely comparing the two, we've seen a lot of differences as far as uh, uh, what they offer. Uh, but you can go there and, and uh, it's either gemini.google.com or google.com slash gemini. I, I can't remember. You can try them both. Facebook has its own open source uh, uh, system called Llama, which once again, hasn't gotten any of the attention of the others because it runs in the background. But considering how good it is at running in the background, at Facebook uh, might be worth knowing about. This one, Anthrop Anthropic, I actually, I'll admit, I haven't tried it yet. The company just announced a week ago that they had a product named Claude that apparently everybody's been raving about as being better than ChatGPT. So that's another one. And there are others. Everybody's out there trying to release their own uh, their own large language model for people to use. Many of these, oh, by the way, I should uh, mention, you know, earlier I talked about the data set that these things are trained on. What's the data set for ChatGPT? It's essentially the entire internet plus some other stuff. Like literally uh, they have a crawler that goes through, pulls out the entire internet and they gave it to ChatGPT or they gave it to GPT and allowed it to kind of digest it, chew on it, come up with its own conclusions and uh, it's got some stuff thrown in from other places as well. That's a lot of the data set. And, you know, how good is are the answers that it's going to give you? Well, a lot of that determined, is determined by the data set that's being fed into it. So earlier I said, it uses probability. It's going to uh, uh, look at the odds and the patterns and sequences and, and give you a result at the end. Once this predictive text, it's predictive text times a billion uh, in order to uh, come up with the conclusions at the end of it. So the neural network that it runs on is called a transformer network, and that once again, you know, I mentioned that sentence earlier that uh, about pitcher pouring in water. This neural network will learn the context and the meaning by tracking all the relationships in the sentence. So looks at the relationship between the words in the sentence, tries to understand the context of, of all the different words, tries to understand the meanings of all these words, and it breaks that sentence down into what are called tokens basically breaks it down into individual words, although there can be other things, parts of words or uh, other other things in there as well, but breaks these sentences down into these little uh, parts, tokens, and then everything that happens after that is math. They transform it all into numbers that are, all these words are weighted differently, and they go through what are called vectors, which retain, which are a numeric way of kind of uh, retaining the relationship between these words. These vectors send it through the system. Attention mechanism focuses on the important parts of the sentence. Maybe the word is isn't as important as some of the other words in the sentence. We also have things in there called parameters, which are basically kind of the, the flavoring uh, as, this, as these go through the system. How do you weight various words and various parts of the process? Uh, it's, I think of it like a flavoring or... or uh, a tuning knob, something like that. So there are humans who can go in there and add parameters and just adjust parameters so that the results end up being better. And so typically you'll hear these systems kind of brag about how many parameters their systems have. So Chet uh, GPT 3.5 had uh, 175 billion parameters. The new one, GPT-4, has 1.7 trillion parameters. So, you know, this does give them a, a way to adjust it as it's going through the system. And they can also have different personalities. So you can, uh, when ChatGPT was released, they had a very feisty version of ChatGPT and a very staid version of, of ChatGPT. They, a lot of these systems have, have found that they need to be a little careful with this because they turns out that they don't think that they want them to have too much personality. But there's all, you know, both the parameters and this personalities all give you a sense of how uh, the people running these systems can uh, uh, tweak them. 
Then we have, and I, by the way, at the end of this, at the end of this, I'll show you ChatGPT in action, and you can uh, certainly do it as well. So text to image models, Dali is uh, created and run by GPT. So once again, it is you know uh, same company as ChatGPT. There's a new product that they have called Sora, which is pretty incredible. I'll show you that too. And in that case, uh, and that's been around or has just been released, I guess, for a few weeks. And you give it a sentence, you say what, a video that you want to see, and it creates a video based on it. Uh, it's not live for people to use yet. A very limited number of people can use it, but they've got examples out there of the prompts that people gave it and the video that was created based on that text prompt. It's it's amazing. We'll look at it in a little bit. Stable Diffusion is another one that's a competitor that's out there. Mid Journey is another one, but Mid Journey is a little bit trickier to use because you need to, to uh, use Discord in order to use it. So all of these systems, you give it a description of what you want to see, and it pops out an image of what you want to see. And in case of Sora, a video of what you want to see. Uh, that they in this case it makes a lot of sense to have these labeled data sets with tons and tons and tons of captains describing the things that were fed into the data set in order to give people the, the results they need. And interestingly, everything is generated from scratch. So if you wanted a picture of, of the Mona Lisa uh, petting a cat, it won't just take a picture of the Mona Lisa and adjust it. It will actually create from scratch, using its knowledge, a picture of the Mona Lisa petting a cat. That's a good idea. We should try that later. So on the left, this is kind of one of the um, probably most famous at this point, uh, generated images of the Pope wearing a white puffy coat. This one is pretty good. If any of you have seen these generated images based on, on real people, they are very, very good. I mean, scarily good. You can sometimes see anomalies like in their fingers, they're kind of infamous. Like people will have six or seven fingers. So there's weird kind of things that, that often aren't quite correct. But this one does look, look pretty good. Or on the right, we have pugs is, as uh, once again, Mona Lisa or tile pug or stained glass pug. So somebody said, you know, give me a picture of a, of a pug in stained glass. And that's what it spit it out for them. Uh, some of you may know, a lot of you may know the picture of a girl with a pearl earring, which is really only this very center part of this image. But what a lot of people have been doing now is they'll put out an image like this and they'll say, give me a picture of the entire room that the girl with the pearl earring is in. And then using its knowledge of this painting and maybe the, the painter's other painting generates this entire background that hadn't been there before. And this is, besides being cool, you know, this is also the type of thing that we're seeing roll on to things like Photoshop when you want to adjust your photos, put in a different sky, put in a different background, whatever these systems are able to, to uh, uh, figure this out. Uh, some of you may be aware of deep fakes. This is where things are starting to get scary. Sora is also starting to get a little bit scary. And uh, these are, uh, I'll show you what this looks like in a second, but these are uh, things where can you trust your eyes as to what you're seeing because artificial intelligence is creating things that look like people and sound like people, but weren't actually created by these people. So here's an example. I am not Morgan Freeman and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? So you can start to see why people are worried about this. You know, the next video that comes out of Donald Trump or Joe Biden saying something off the wall was that thing created as a deep fake. Pretty, pretty scary. So the, there is a lot of potential for AI in kind of real world situations. Certainly. Uh, entertainment and media, uh, a lot of potential options. Are we going to be getting AI 
created music. Actually, we have musicians who are starting to license their image, their their sound or their voices, and reward people to come up with a who come up with a song that sounds like them. Uh, but you know, they're in that case they're working with it uh, as or AI generated scripts. And actually, this has been controversial. Part of that uh, the strike that happened in Hollywood. I guess last year is because people wanted control over the AI generated images that were potentially going to be created. Blog posts, if you have a, a and you're, we're starting to see this in the real world where people who have websites or who want to do emails will have AI create a four paragraph post for them. And actually, uh, Sports Illustrated was in the news about this a, a few months ago where they were not only generating an article with AI, but they generated a fake person and a fake bio to go along with that article. And, and they didn't say it. And people got suspicious and they looked at the article and looked at the writer and it turns out that that person didn't actually exist. So, you know, we're, this, there's a lot of potential for useful content being created this way. A lot of potential for uh, schlocky content to be created this way. We'll see kind of uh, what happens, but but certainly it's going to be so easy to create content. We'll have to keep an eye out for that. Uh, images, visual effects. Are we going to be able to clone uh, whoever Ryan Gosling and keep him forever young and whatever movies? And maybe he decides that he doesn't want to make any effort anymore, so he just clones his image or he he, he licenses images for uh, future AI voice artists, interactivity. That's uh, uh, kind of an interesting idea, which is these entertainment systems can learn, once again, uh, interact with you and personalize for you based on how you've interacted before and your interests and things like that. So it may make a whole new type of uh, uh, creative relationship. But it'll be interesting to see. I mean, there are a lot of people in entertainment media who are frightened by it, but some are certainly out there looking to potentially take advantage of it. Certainly will be big in business, already is big in business, analyzing the data that's presented for companies and providing research uh, and analyzing their customers, looking for trends. Remember, I talked about unstructured data. You could throw in all this data and it will make these connections. And, you know, it's going to be great for businesses that just have tons of data, just throw it in this black box and let it go, let it churn away. Uh, it'll, once again, you know, it'll, it'll allow a good amount of personalization based on the data sets that are presented by it. So, a company can have a smaller data set based on their business, based on their clients, based on their uh, employees, and just have that as the basis for their AI system. Uh, business writing, this is, I showed you an example of my slides, but certainly you know, no shortage of that type of thing. Chatbots, customer relations, automation of manual tasks, things like that. Healthcare, another place where we're looking for it to be big. Virtual nursing, predicting illness, go in there, put in your your symptoms and uh, it will potentially tell you what's wrong with you, recommend treatment for you. Now, all of these, by the way, we're also looking at it to take care of these kind of routine, repetitive, administrative tasks and so not just healthcare. But if you ask pe uh, people who work in healthcare, a lot of times what they say, the worst part is all these kind of dealing with insurance companies, you know, this repetitive type of uh, uh, administrative stuff. And, and hopefully the AI will be able to take care of that stuff a lot better. And then research, finding connections on its own and coming up with, with uh, solutions uh, certainly will affect computer programming, where if you are creating code or optimizing code, it can give you suggestions on the code in real time and debug code. If you're a small business person and you're looking to create a website or e-commerce site, then uh, these systems tell them what you want and you don't have to be a developer and that they'll potentially create them for you. Uh, natural language processing. So um, you can ask a system to create code, just tell it what it wants to do. And it does the coding for you, you know, without you having to be a coder. And then once again, automating all the IT stuff. Another one where it could be huge, right? Education. So uh, not only could it be a tutor and give feedback on kids' assignments, these types of things, it can generate all types of lesson plans and not just lesson plans, but it can individualize them. So if you're a teacher and you know, you, you've got this class full of kids, all of different levels, inclusion and all this type of stuff, maybe AI gives you the ability to tweak all this stuff all over the place to, to uh, personalize it for those individuals in your classroom to grading and maybe some administrative tasks as well. 
warfare. Uh, they're using AI already to process satellite images, see what's hidden in there that, that people can't necessarily see. Maybe it, weaponry will be flying by itself and making its own decision. And certainly a lot of the logistics things that are happening in the background, like the other ones. So everybody's worried about jobs for, for good reason. It will probably displace a lot of jobs will hopefully create a lot of opportunities such as the below i mean if you're looking if you're if you or your kid or your grandkid is looking to get into any type of technology then obviously ai and robotics hot areas right now uh prompt engineering specifically that's kind of how you get an ai system what do you say to the ai system they give it the best answers and you know, like chat gpt has all this uh, has an entire part of its website where it gives you all these tips about uh, tweaking the system so that you actually get the answers that you're looking for. As an entrepreneur, uh, it's potentially going to let you uh, make it easier for you to do things on your own because you just ask, once again, your system, create a website, give me some business names, give me a business plan, who can I talk to, blah, blah, blah. You know, it is a partner for you in uh, whatever you're doing moving forward with your business strategy. Human machine teaming is an interesting thing, is an interesting thing where as these systems uh, kind of uh, become more and more common, humans are still going to have to work with them. So there are going to be people who specialize in how do people interact with machines. Ethics is going to be a huge issue. It's we're already seeing it in legality. There's not a whole lot of legal kind of guidance right now, but it's going to become more and more defined as things go on. So there are going to be people, and this is going to be a huge area, you know, for law and 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 uh, compliance and things like that moving forward certainly there will be new creative output puts for those uh, looking for that type of thing but in the meantime what these systems can't really do well are act like humans so soft skills working with other people uh, communication listening those types of things now there are certainly a lot of questions around ethics involved in these systems this one this first one i, I think is a key one that's going to be raising its ugly little head for a while now and we're already starting to see it and that's the the idea of bias uh you know these systems are trained on data sets and they're only as good as the data that's fed into them and earlier i said gpt is trained on the internet well on the internet there's a lot of place where maybe uh there's there's various religious biases and political biases biases around sexual orientation, all these types of things that we see in society being fed into these systems where they may just be repeating them. And that could be problematic. And conversely, by the way, if you're interested in reading up on this Google Gemini issue that happened a, a couple of weeks ago, in that case, uh, Google almost went the other direction where people were asking for pictures of the founding fathers and you got a picture of a black George Washington. And it was almost like... Uh, uh, Google Gemini, somebody had gone in there and said, we need to basically come up with a, a uh, less biased version of uh, of race for when people are asking questions. But what they ended up giving was an inaccurate version of a lot of these questions because George Washington wasn't black. So it's commendable on one hand that they're trying to, uh, uh, you know, deal with, with, with racial stereotyping, things like that. On the other hand, you need to get accurate information. And so moving forward, this I think is gonna be a huge struggle because people are going to have this idea that these systems, you feed in a bunch of data and it just gives you the truth. And we're gonna to start to see, well, what is the truth? It's gonna spit out answers that we may not disagree with. They may not align with our view of the world. And uh, we're gonna to have to figure out how to, how to deal with that. So that's gonna be controversial, I think. I think these systems are gonna work really well in kind of smaller systems, business systems and things like that. But as they roll out and more people uh, uh, start to come across this stuff, it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with it. And by the way, that Google Gemini example I gave you, they, it happened a bunch of places where they were giving uh, various races where it wasn't accurate. And they pulled that. They pulled the image generation because it wasn't accurate and they were doing this. And, and 
we'll see what happens with that. It's it's interesting to read about if if you want to look up look into it. Uh, deep fakes and phishing. We talked about this a little bit. Not only that, but we're there's, we're starting to have this issue where there's a lot of fake nudes out there, and not just celebrities, but people. You, you've got a teenager, teenage girl, a fourteen year old in high school, and her her classmates creating uh, fake nudes of her, things like that. So clearly, you know, just on a personal level and uh, and a larger political level, these can, this can be huge. Uh, data privacy, so that's things like uh, uh, facial recognition or just, and facial recognition is another one that has been the news about uh, how it's not necessarily accurate all the time and it's uh, certain races it does better than others and what where do they keep the information, how do they use the information, Plus, if you're a business and you're pulling in a data set of your employees, what happens with that data privacy or libel? What happens when these systems put out information that's libelous or inaccurate? Who's responsible for that? Is it the the data? Is it the people who created the AI system? These AI systems, once again, only as good as the data feeding in. So is it is it the data that's to blame? Uh, copyright sourcing. The New York Times is suing uh, GPT because people were able to ask in a specific way in order to get chat GPT to spit out an exact New York times article and New York times is saying, wait a second, that's, he got a copyright on that. Uh, um, oh, I'm forgetting her name, Sarah Silverman and a few other kind of authors sued uh, GPT because they didn't like their material being part of this massive data dump that's being put into the system without their permission. Their lawsuit was rejected. The New York Times one, I think is still going on, but this is going to be another kind of huge issue about who owns what in the system where it's uh, uh, throwing all this, all this data in it and letting the system come up with its own answers. Some other kind of things that we need to think about when it comes to AI. First of all, what we call the black box problem, which is this system has all this data into it, in it and it's spitting out answers. And a lot of times we don't know how it came to the conclusions that it came to. And, uh, you know, even the people running the systems, they don't know why it came up with the answer that it came up with. And there are two responses to that. One is that we need to build the system so that we can go back and see uh, why that happened. Number two is that it doesn't matter. Just make sure that it's spitting out accurate answers. Uh, it's eventually these systems will get more and more integrated. Microsoft is going to integrate uh, is going to integrate uh, GPT and Copilot into all of its apps. They're starting to charge businesses for their kind of advanced version of Copilot. You know, twenty bucks ahead, something like that. But versus going off and searching on the ChatGPT website. You know, this allows you to uh, use these things within other apps they are already. And we're seeing that a certain amount already where AI is built into apps and they're constantly saying, oh, you can do this, create a resume using AI. Job displacement, yes. Jobs were going to be disappearing and new jobs will be created. Uh, that will clearly be an issue just like when they got, when the automobile replaced the, the horse and buggy. It is expensive to run. It's ChatGPT, the company, they're not making money yet. It runs seven hundred. It costs seven hundred thousand dollars a day to run it, so it it is expensive. Adversarial machine learning, content ma manipulation. There's a lot of kind of sneaky people out there who are either trying to fool machines or manipulate what they're putting in the machines to get it to spit out answers that it shouldn't. An example of adversarial machine learning is like if a self-driving car comes across a stop sign, it should stop. But if somebody puts a, and this is something that's actually happened that they've, they've got documentation about it, puts a piece of tape on the stop sign so that it looks a little bit different. The self-driving car won't recognize it as a stop sign. It will go right through it. Or content manipulation earlier, I'd said it won't tell you how to create malware or to create a atomic bomb or something like that. But people have tried to get it to do some unsavory things or bad things or things that it's not supposed to do through sneaky ways by breaking up into processes, things like that. Hallucination is another big problem, which is that uh, you will often, I shouldn't say often, sometimes get an answer from the AI system and it will sound like it knows what it's talking about. It will say, this is blah, 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 blah. And it turns out it's making it up. It's, it's, it's full of it. Uh, it's, it's nonsense. 
and it gives you the wrong answer. That's what they call a hallucination. And that's one of the reasons why you need to kind of be careful with the answers that these systems give you, because not only may they not be accurate, but they may sound, they're not saying, oh, I don't know, but it could be this. They're saying, well, this is the answer. Turns out it's actually wrong. It's just what they call a hallucination. And then the singularity is, uh, if you are into science fiction, that's uh, the, the hypothetical future point when technological growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible and all the AI systems design, decide that humans are the problem. We ask an AI system to solve global warning, uh, warming and they decide humans are the problem and they decide to kill us all. So, you know, that is one of these science fiction-y type things. I think there are other bigger problems at hand right now, but it is uh, something that we need to consider as we look at kind of guardrails moving forward. Now, uh, there is not much re regulation and legis legislation at hand. Who are the people who are going to decide the future of AI? It's, you know, this is a tough question when it comes to all this technology, because the, if you ask the, the people on the board of Chet, of, of, of OpenAI, ChatGPT, they're saying, well, we have, you know, we know what's going on here and we want to make it the right thing. And, and we're going to, you need to, you need to trust us. And we see time and again that, that we can't necessarily trust. They may think that they're doing the right thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can trust the people running the companies. On the other hand, should we be trusting the 80 year old Senator uh, that represents us who, who, you know, may not be able to work his or her smartphone it's a tough question about uh, how we're going to come up with these decisions. They have come up with some regulation in the European Union because they tend to be ahead. Uh, ahead may not be the right word, but they tend to be aggressive with this stuff. Uh, I think a lot of it is based upon uh, facial recognition and what you can do with it. No real national legislation in the U.S. The Biden administration offered what they call a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, but it doesn't really do anything. Various state laws in effect. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at ChatGPT. I still have uh, the chat room over there if you want to toss me any questions. Uh, but I'm going to show you, once again, easiest way to get to ChatGPT is to go to bing.com. Even if you don't use the Microsoft Edge web browser, you can just go to bing.com and uh, at the top, there's that co-pilot that I was talking about. Oh, they keep trying to uh, uh, put out co-pilot as their branding. So uh, when you see co-pilot, that is their AI thing. You can go to ChatGPT itself and sign up for an account for free. Once again, it's easier and you get the newest version of the GPT, uh, the GPT data set by going to bing.com and just clicking on co-pilot. So we'll click on co-pilot and notice, by the way, that they have different flavors. I, earlier I said you kind of can have different personalities, be more creative, more balanced, more precise, but I will go ahead and I will say, um, what should I say? Give me five, it's five potential business names for a horse and carriage company in Chicago. Charming business. It came up with it on its own, by the way. There are five charming business names. And uh, you notice that they do give me a couple that are specific to Chicago. Uh, Windy City. Uh, oh, this is interesting. This is new. I, I, I've i never seen them actually give me links to different websites before. It's a new thing that they put in. Uh, Windy City Carriages. Magnificent Mile Carriages. Lakefront Livery. Carriage Couriers. Prairie Trotters. Uh, okay. How about let's have it um, give me um, a three paragraph summary of how the Mayan temples were built by aliens. I just came up with that on the fly. Don't ask. Oh, this is more extensive than I thought it was going to give me. I asked for three paragraphs and giving me three paragraphs with multiple uh, bullet points. 
So, you know, a lot of people are worried about kids using these for papers, things like that, which maybe is you should worry about it. But uh, it also, I think, is great for a starting point uh, for further research. Yeah, this is new with them giving links. Uh, they just uh, they didn't do this last time I was doing this. Or, you know, let's great, get creative. Write me a song. Oh, let's 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 keep with the Mayans about uh, aliens and Mayan pyramids in the style of ABBA. Won't do the music, but it'll do the the lyrics hopefully. Cosmic rendezvous, rendezvous. Wow, it's pre-chorus and verse, pre-chorus and a chorus. Okay, that's pretty detailed. So by the way, if any of you are musicians and you want this, you can't have it. It's mine. No, I'm just kidding. You want it, you can have it. Take me to the Milky Way. You can almost hear the ladies of ABBA uh, sing that. So, yeah, let's try an image. Earlier I, I suggested um, make me a uh, picture of, I forgot what I said, an elephant riding a horse. I don't know, let's make it more fun than that. Riding a, uh, um, a blimp and eating a banana in, uh, in the style of Picasso. Oh, by the way, say so as it's creating it, uh, let me point out at the bottom here that one nice thing that also these systems do is they remember your previous query. So maybe uh, by the time it's still trying to figure it out, but maybe uh, I decided that I, I, I don't know how that's like Picasso, <laughs> but it's still pretty good, right? Uh, maybe I wanted to follow up and actually I'd rather have a pink elephant or I want it, uh, they're, they've got a suggestion here, change it to a giraffe riding a helicopter and eating pizza in Van Gogh's style. Add some clouds in the background. Oh, let's add some clouds, why not? So, you know, it doesn't, the system as a whole doesn't remember what people are asking, but it can tweak what I just did and uh, uh, make changes accordingly. Let's do these clouds. And once again, you know, you wanna go play with it. There's nothing stopping you from going to bing.com clicking on Copilot at the top and and uh, asking it. And actually, I'm at the point now where I've got a, a, a kind of a shortcut to it on my desktop. Oh yeah, a lot more cloud. Shortcut on my desktop. Rather than Googling certain questions, I'll just launch ChatGPT and just go ask it a question. So I wanna show, excuse me, show you Soma. Oh, not what I meant to get. I'm sorry, it's Sora. <laughs> You can feel free to look up Soma too, but we'll, we'll do Sora. Uh, Sora is openai.com slash Sora. And in this case, uh, like I said, this isn't available for people to use, for you and I to use. It's available for uh, people who have access to it, which is a very limited group. And you can see here a prompt, a stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filmed with warm glowing neon animated neon, and animated city signage, wears a black leather jacket, yada, yada. And this video is created by the system itself. No, nobody filmed anything. This is all AI generated. Uh, another prompt, several woolly mammoths approach treading a snowy meadow. Um, pretty darn amazing. And this is one where probably it won't be too long before uh, this is out there for the public. And hey, look at this, look at this guy's face. This is an AI generated face. I mean, how long until we've got movies that are all created by another AI generated face until we've got movies that are created this way. Uh, I think they're a little bit worried about what people are gonna create, which is why another reason why it hasn't been released to the public yet, but I, it has to be a matter of time. And uh, so anyway, that one is at ai.com slash Sora, if you're interested in looking at it. Okay, so that's what I've got for you. Uh, I haven't seen anything in the chat room or the Q&A. Certainly feel free to put something in there and I will try my hardest to answer it.
Valerie, I'm not seeing any questions in there yet, but uh, yeah, if you no, want to throw in anything. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing anything either, Mike. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the program, we did record tonight's session, so it'll be up on our uh, YouTube channel within the next couple of days, so you could check it out again there if you want to replay any of it. Um, thank you, Mike, as always. Uh, awesome presentation. Um, a lot to, oh, here, something just popped up in the chat right yes. now. So. Just a compliment. I'll take it. Okay, thank okay. you, anonymous attendee. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Well, I think that's it. Um, until uh, I'm sure Michael. Be An back. Um, one, 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 one more thing, Valerie, oh. anonymous <laughs> attendee just asked if I can send out links. But what do you mean by links? I I'm happy to send you my slideshow if you're interested, if that's what you mean. Um, anybody who wants a copy of it, I'll put in my email in the chat room. It's Mike at vspchicago.com mike at vspchicago.com that's in the chat room right now or if you don't catch it ask val at the library and uh i'll make sure that that she forwards your email to me and i'll send it to you all right well thank Thank you, Mike. If yeah, if anyone misses out on uh, Mike's email, just uh, reach out to me and I could forward it on to you. Um, thank you, Mike. It was great. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Great. Go play with this stuff. Yeah. It's out there and uh, available so that you can amaze yourself. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.